Nah. All right, guys, we're live with George Coyle again. And, and <coughs> today we want to talk to you guys about something that every trader deals with, which is choppy trends, annoying trading periods in your account that drive you crazy. Um, and so, you know, George and I were talking a little bit about off mic about this. And I think that was what uh, kind of sparked me to think about this a little bit more because it's something I've been talking about in my letter for a while. Like, hey, it's summer. It's going to it's going to suck. Um, I know that's not exactly the right way to gain more subscribers and get more people to pay attention to you, but you have to understand that about trading. If you want to be a good trader, if you want to be a good trader, you have to understand your 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 strategy will not always fit with the market environment. And so trend following trading, breakout trading, um, you know, when you're in the summer, most of the time there's a lot of false starts and so on. We had a great start to the year, then mid-year comes, and we've just been flat and chopping around ever since. So, you know, George, have you, did you, you know, and this is a, a question, I should ask you this off mic because I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here, but did you ever read about any of the, the greats, like talking about choppy periods that you can think of off the top of your head? Um, nothing in particular comes to mind beyond, I guess, the systematic guys saying just stick with your system. And yeah, there's just, I guess the biggest thing would be in the trader principles book that I wrote or long paper, whatever you want to call it. There was a section and, and it was a bunch of guys saying nothing works all the time and everything works sometimes. And I guess from that, you know, you see a hundred years of people saying nothing works all the time and you find it with your own approach. So I think it's just a, a, a truism of trading that your strategies are going to go through these periods where they don't work nothing works all the time and uh, to be very repetitive but uh yeah i think we sort of collectively before we know much about how investing works and how markets work we have this vision of sort of like a an equity curve you know the, the your money rising sort of like a, you own a t-bill right so it's like uh, there's a stair step up and another stair step up and it just keeps going like that and, and the truth is no matter what your style even you know buy and hold like returns come in clusters, drawdowns are, are a reality. Um, I did some study once on, it was a very quick quantification, but it was just like, look at the S&P 500, what percentage of the time is it in a drawdown? And it was way more than half. Um, you know, it doesn't mean it was down 20, 30, 40%, but it was not at its highs a lot of the time. And so I think from quantifying stuff like that and hearing people tell you nothing works all the time and, and seeing it with your own results, you kind of come to this conclusion of, yeah, the way money's made in in really anything outside of you know coupons on fixed income is basically it's clumpy. You know, it's long periods of nothing followed by big boosts and big booms, and then it starts again. And depending on you know which approach you use, um, meaning like trend following will kind of like gravitate down for a few years. It's four years is about what I've seen studying them, but. And then it'll just make a ton of money super fast. And usually that's where people give up and then it goes straight up. Right. But the other strategies are the same and you see it, see it in everything like, you know, Hollywood movies, a bunch of them will lose money. And then one tentpole movie makes a ton of money and covers the rest. I think one in 10 movies makes money. Um, houses, you know, we all talk about, Oh, we're going to make all this money in houses. And I've seen people selling houses recently. And it's like, when you adjust for time and inflation, they actually lost money, but then, Somebody will buy a house and a bunch of money will come into that area and it'll go up 50% in a year. And so I guess backing away, I'm just kind of thinking out loud, but it's like returns in all of these disciplines, all forms of investment are, are clumpy. You know, they come in clumps and you have long periods where it, it sucks. And we were talking a little bit off offline about, uh, I, I've been thinking a lot about Forrest Gump. Um, and his shrimp boat, I assume everybody's probably seen Forrest Gump, but he had the shrimp boat and he kept pulling in boots and toilet seats and nothing but, you know, nothing that he wanted. And then the great storm came and it wiped out all the other boats because he was out with uh, Lieutenant Dan. And then he had the only shrimp boat and, and he, he crushed it. Right. And I, I think a lot about that as it relates to liquid alts right now, because they're just a nobody really wants them for a dozen reasons. And I'll write up a post you know, this week about it. But. I guess in aggregate, the realities that you see, which you may not want to accept, 
are that the returns are clumpy and there's often long periods of sort of just grind and sideways and it's discouraging and you don't really know for sure if it's going to work again. And so you kind of got to keep the faith with whatever your approach is, whether you're a trend follower betting on outliers or you're Warren Buffett betting that America will just keep getting better. So I guess that's a, it's a long winded, but good summary of my kind of thoughts on it. Yeah, personally, I'm sort of not trading isn't going real well. It's not going terribly either right now, but it's certainly a frustrating period because it's just sitting here and it's like, okay, when does it start working again? And you just don't know. It could be six months, it could be six years. Hopefully it won't be that long, but uh, yeah. No, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, I, I just wrote on Twitter returns are like lumpy mashed potatoes. I mean, it's, it's the truth is it's sometimes you hit them um, and, it, and it's great, but I think the, the biggest idea and the reason why people always talk about, you know, uh, risk management, like the boring conversations that we have on this channel again and again, hey, manage your risk. Hey, 1% risk is, is enough. Um, hey, if you go to 2%, great. Hey, if you're trying to, depending on what you're really trying to do, if you're really trying to make all the money in the world in two trades, uh, good luck. Um, it, it's, it could happen, uh, but you're, the probabilities of it happening are pretty low. Um, but if you're trying to be a consistent trader, make money every single year, risk management is important. And the reason is, I don't think it's only because, hey, look at this one to five risk ratio. I think it's also it keeps you alive for those good periods. Like if you're able to just go, hey, I'm treading water. Hey, I'm not really making money, but I'm not really losing everything. Um, I have enough to once once my strategy really starts to kick in it's going to move. You know, my portfolio is going to make some major returns. And I, I think, you know, I had a great conversation the other day. Well, it wasn't a great, great conversation, but somebody just asked me a question and it was, uh, it, it's right on the subject. So he asked me what, you know, I had these, I had the triple digit years in 2020, 2021. And, you know, he asked me the rest of my returns. And so I sent him all my returns and so on. And he said, you know, what do you think happened in the years after that? And, you know, it wasn't like I had negative years. They were still good years. I even had a, a year over 50%. And I was like, you know, what do you, what do you mean what happened? I mean, there, we were positive most years. Like we did really good all, all these years, basically. Sorry, positive all the years. Um, and so basically I'm having this conversation with him and he goes, well, if you trade well, then you should be able to make the same return every single year. And I thought that was, you know, it, it's a very new trader thing to say because you think like somebody works hard on this. They learn how to do it well. Therefore, they can put a trade on. And then when they put a trade on, they're right a lot and they understand that they can just uh, get a 100% return every single year. But something that you learn over time is that as, tr as a trader, those years are few and far between you understand that the liquidity of the Fed is one of your biggest drivers and could be a tailwind for you to make a lot of money if you're positioned the right way. And it's another thing, and we'll talk about, I'll let you go, but I also want to talk about the idea of kind of getting irresponsibly long as a systematic trader, um, because those years you would be kind of irresponsibly long certain things because so many things are correlating together. If you have a an energy position, you have crude oil, you have natural gas, not that natural gas is that correlated, but you have crude oil, natural gas, you have uh, heating oil, you have gasoline, you have the energy sector, you know, you're, you're basically getting very long these things. And it's all kind of one trade. And that's what kind of happened those years. So I'll kick it back to you. But then we'll get back into that one. Yeah, I mean, Bernie Madoff made about the same returns every year, right? And we know what happened <laughs> there. So I think like one of the things I was thinking as you were talking is just we collectively like stories as, as humans, right? We like fairy tales and the idea of overnight success. Yeah, well, a lot of people say, yeah, it was an overnight success 20 years later, but we don't want to hear about the, the 19 years into the 20th, you know, and the books aren't written about that. It's like I could use a simple analogy to say Jesse Livermore, right? We love his story. He's stood the test of time and his, his nemesis, Arthur Cutton, is not. Why not? You know, because Cutton went to bed at 10 p.m., went home to his wife, lived on a farm in Illinois outside Chicago. Livermore had showgirls, and booms and busts, and went broke, and 
cutting in too, but we, we like to focus on the excitement, I guess. We like the lottery winners. We don't, you know, like I bought a ticket. I bought a ticket for 20 years and then it works. So I, I think our perceptions get sort of askew from reality because we like to focus on the stories of wins. And that makes sense, right? I don't want to read a story about the guy on year 19 who's been failing. I want to hear that he made it. But um, I, I guess it's just something that I think needs to be balanced because you need to basically balance, you know, your, your focus on the exciting periods with the realities of how the game actually works. So, yeah, there's that. You know, I guess another thing, you were talking about triple digit returns. So a couple of years ago, I was trading stocks uh, long discretionarily and I was making around 25% a year, no leverage, concentrated positions. Um, and you know, my max drawdown, I think, using dailies was about five or 6%, which is very, very good, right? And the reality of it was that I just, if something didn't go very quickly, I would get out. I was kind of using the liver more like if, if you're, if you buy something that's doing this trajectory and it doesn't keep going by day five, something is wrong, so dump it. And I had all these protocols to exit, essentially. And it went well. And then 2022 came along and I did absolutely nothing because nothing fit sort of the setup of what I was looking for. And I said, I'm not going to deviate from this approach that I have because I know that, you know, the switches kill you, essentially, to quote Victor Niederhofer and an old horse racing book. But I guess the point is, you know, those 25% returns gradually came down just by virtue of having no returns, no losses either. But so to, to the point you were making like hundred percent a year, it's just, it's not realistic. Even if you can make great returns in these ideal windows, 2020, 21 for stocks, let's say, then if you stick to your process and you don't do anything in the subsequent difficult years, the bear markets, you don't make any money. So your returns by definition just drop. And of course, if you're doing it for yourself, you got to stay patient. You got to have the sort of the stomach to do it again when the stars align. Uh, investors hate that stuff. But I guess the point is like, just back to reality here. It's like, you look at this stuff and you have these great years, but then you have years that maybe they're not even bad. They're just, nothing happens. And the average of all of that brings down your average returns. So more doses of fun reality for everybody here today. Yeah, I'll, I'll pause there. No, I mean, I, I think that's a, when you, when you look at yourself as a trader, you have to understand your strengths and weaknesses. And, and one of those strengths for some, I think none of our strengths is being underwater. Like nobody's very good at chopping around and not making returns and down years and down quarters. I mean, it's not a fun thing to deal with as a trader. So we want to believe there's this magical way to do it, right? Where you could just put this, I mean, I you have I had people when I had Shapiro on, they were like, you know, you guys seem like you're good enough at trading. You could put together 1% uh, a day, you know, for for the rest of your life. And it's like, yeah, that sounds really cool. Like, you know, I, I wish that was a possibility, but I think we've all been there. We've all tried that. Um, we've all lost money doing that, you know, at least myself. Like, sure, there's some day traders out there that can do it. It's not me. Uh, I know that. Uh, but it, yes. Yeah. But but if it's a situation where it's somebody that, you know, for me, I understand I'm good at breakouts. I'm good at handling the volatility. I'm good at those things. Like I understand the type of trader I am. Um, but I also understand that those periods of choppiness where the market's going sideways, I, I am not the guy who's going to make all the money in the world in those. And most people aren't going to whether you're if you're a buy and hold trader, you're, you're not going to hold or investor you're not going to hold uh, and make a bunch of money in those periods either. Um, if you're a, you know, you can trade ranges and you're very good at range trading. Yeah, there's that's that's your time. That's your time to shine. Um, but if you're looking for those big winners and you're looking at keeping your lo losers small, catching those big winners, those major trends, those major secular trends, um, you really have to understand that you're going to deal with those periods of flat, annoying trading. And like, once again, it's a dose of reality here because we <coughs> we're, we're always trying to tell you guys the truth of trading. There's there's a lot of people out there. I could go on to anything today and go check out YouTube, go check out Twitter, whatever I want to get on. And I'm sure I could find tons of people making up stuff about trading. I mean, even like 
you know, I'll make a joke, for example, like, cause I don't really, it's my systems, you know, I put my systems together and like, you know, I'll be like, oh, this is trending up. This could, you know, would you buy calls on gold? And everybody has a big opinion. Every, some people are very mad. Some people are very happy about it. Um, you know, everybody has to have an opinion on it. But as, as a trader, it's like you, if you're an analyst, you have, have and this is a conversation to, to kick over you too. As an analyst, you can make these big, bold calls. Um, you can come in and make big, bold calls and everybody respects it. They go, hell yeah, look at that dude. I don't even care that he's wrong. He comes, I came out there with conviction. And you hear that all the time. Uh, but as a trader, we don't have that luxury. <laughs> that, that luxury just isn't there to just go out there and go, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to go all in on, uh, you know, the, the I'm going to short the British pound today because I believe this about the Bank of Great Britain and so on. Um, and I'm going to go all in like, yeah, our, our, our people might love it. Like our investors might be psyched on it at first, but when we lose the, all of their money, they're not going to be very happy about it. And, and they're not going to go, Hey, that was a great call. I don't care. You had good conviction. Well, lots of, uh, threads to pull on there. I guess, uh, the first one is this is a nice little group therapy session here this week for me. <laughs> and I think one of the things, cause you know, I'm not, it's been tough lately for me trading and, you know, and I know all this stuff, but it helps to sort of, I guess, say it out loud in a, in a group setting and kind of be like, Oh yeah, right. I got to remind myself. And that's yeah. to a large degree. Most of the stuff I write is actually written for myself as a reminder, because I find like it, there's two parts of your mind, right? There's the logical side and then there's the subconscious emotional side. Dalio talks about this in it's Dakota and whatever, but it, it helps to, for me at least, to continually remind yourself of the realities of the business, especially when you get discouraged. Um, so, yeah, as far as strengths, you know, because you mentioned it, I think my biggest strength as a trader seems to be protecting capital, minimizing drawdowns. I'm very, very good at that when trading discretionarily because I use emotions in line with my view of what Soros did. And as soon as something doesn't feel right, I'm just out. So I never really lose money, but it's also very exhausting. And there's times where, you know, the markets will be going way down and then they'll zag back up and I won't be there because I'll be out because of my process. So it works for me, even though it can be frustrating. Um, but for investors, it just doesn't work because they'll be like, well, I didn't, why the hell didn't you capture any of this? So one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking is just the, the difference between managing money for yourself, doing quote unquote, the right thing, and then managing money for investors. And the more you do this, or I do this, the more I see they're not the same thing. You basically have to, you know, you, you have to decide which one you're doing and you have to tailor what you're doing to a degree to that. Now, there are some people I've talked to who say, oh, yeah, you know, I found the perfect investors who not only do they not get in my head, and make it difficult when I'm trading discretionarily, but they support me because they have total faith and belief. But I think that's it's a reality that you could maybe put together over time and it takes a long time to get there. So, um, yeah, the researcher, the big, bold calls, you know, I guess you become famous by having strong conviction, especially if it's bearish conviction and being right while everybody else goes broke. But if you make that call all the time, it doesn't work out well. You know, Ray Dalio, early in his career, he had a research business and he was getting paid thousands of dollars a year. And this is back in the 70s or 80s. So it's big money, right? Inflation adjusted. And he spoke to Congress and he was telling people that the world was going to end and then it didn't. And he lost all of his clients and had to fire everyone and start over from scratch. And obviously he, you know, rose like a phoenix and built what he built. But I think he sort of realized that the, the doomsday prophecy uh, gets attention and you need attention if you're going to raise money. But he also realized this is just my perception from reading between the lines that you can't invest like that all the time or uh, or it goes poorly. But I guess people that have conviction, we we like that. You know, we, we don't want to see the guy look fight or flight. Right. In trading, it's all about flight. Just run away, live to fight another day. But go back to the schoolyard. Assuming you were raised somewhere where you went to school. If one kid says, I want to fight you and the other guy's like, no, no, I want to survive and runs home. We're all like, look at that guy. You know, like what a what a wimp. Um, and I wrote a post about this too, I'll, I'll grab it, but it's sort of about how culturally Western culture is against good trading. But yeah, look, I mean, I guess kind of meandering here again, I think the key no, is, this is good. if you have, um, 
if, if you have conviction, people like that, you know, we want to rally behind the person who has conviction. You know, we watch, to the best of my knowledge, there's no big short movie about a trend follower who ran a systematic strategy because we'd all be asleep in minute five. Meanwhile, you see Michael <laughs> Burry and he's like, I read through all this stuff and I figured it out. He knew it was going to happen. And, you know, he figured out the right bed and it's very dramatic and he does very well. And he, even though everybody was, don't do it, get out, you know, he stuck with it and he, and he crushed it. So that's, it's certainly one path. You know, what I've found is, the guys who seem to do the best in terms of the, the hybrid of like returns, managing drawdowns and raising money, find some middle ground between using trading principles, maybe running a system in the background is sort of a, to manage some of their money, but not all having a fundamental opinion. But then in the press, you know, they don't talk about, well, the secret to good trading is cutting your losses. They talk about, well, the Bank of Japan has changed course for this, and that's why I want to be long the yen because the positioning of the you know, speculators versus commercials and the fundamentals are here. And if you look at these five historical instances over the last hundred years of different countries that have undergone no inflation and then chase interest rate policy, blah, 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 blah. And we'll all sit there and be like, oh, my gosh, this guy's great. But, you know, I guess I'm thinking of Soros and Drug Miller. They also say it's not working. Get out. There's an interesting... Um, it was in hedge fund market wizards. It was Colin O'Shea, and he was talking about working with Soros and how Soros was talking to the Financial Times or somebody about this currency position, and it sounded like this gigantic structural position he had. And then it went; the price went the other way, and he just dumped it. And it was gone. And O'Shea, if that's how you pronounce his name, was kind of like, "Whoa, that was a, that was a big thing." It was, you know, here I thought like this was going to be a multi-year structural position, and no, he dumped it as soon as the price went against him. So. I guess to sort of summarize everything I've said, you know, I think the research, the stories, it helps to raise money. It also probably helps to hold positions, right? If you have a reason to own something that's exciting, it's easier to hold on than if not. So like take AI, right? All these executives, the stuff that I read in transcripts, they're like, we're in the first inning, first inning. I hear that so many times and there's going to be all kinds of new companies that come to deal with this. So if I get long an AI stock and it starts to go up, I'm like, yeah, this is going to go forever. The executives are spending the money. There's going to be you know, new stuff, new applications. It's going to create efficiencies and, and whatnot. Um, but I'll cut it if it turns against me. But I think having that fundamental view to me is better. Now, that said, the guy who has the fundamental view and says the market is wrong, he's probably going to get a bigger following. And I'll, I'll do one more thing on this, then I'll stop. But I wrote a newsletter once where I was like doing fundamentals and I was combining it with basically trend models. And the idea was you align with the fundamentals, but if it goes down, you cut your loss. And it never got that far because people really didn't like it. They'd be like, wait a minute, you're telling me that so-and-so is going to grow for the next 10 years at a 20% CAGR uh, compound annual growth rate. And we just dumped the stock because it went down 6%. Like what, the hell's the matter with you? You know, we're like, you're cutting off your nose to spite your face, right? Like you're, you're leaving so much on the table. And so that subsequently I've learned more and gotten better at explaining it, but it's like that union of fundamental story and trading is to me the right way to do it. But yeah, the guys who say this is the stock to own and here's why, and they just pepper you with data points and the enterprise value, the EBITDA and the trends and Warren Buffett owns it. They get more of a following because people love that stuff. So I'll, I'll pause there. That was a, that was a long one. <laughs> no, that's perfect. I, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I love the way you said that because it's, um, it, it's all the truth. Really, it's a, and like that one, I love that you keep bringing up uh, Colm O'Shea. I always love that chapter. That's one of my favorite chapters in the, in the Market Wizard series. Um, you know, he, he talks so much about George Soros being a great uh, loss taker. And I think that's, that's part of it is you could have this very strong opinion, but have this weakly held position, you know, and I think that's the thing that pe people enjoy that you have this full conviction, but at the same time, like, you know, in the back of your head, you have a price level that you're going to get out on and it doesn't matter. It's the same thing as, you know, you could, you could say you're trending my, and, and it's interesting you bring up that point. Cause one thing that I found in uh, when I'm looking at markets, for example, if I look at the fundamentals, and I look at the market, 
and then I just take my signals. Most of the time, the fundamentals don't align. Um, and that's also a kind of an interesting <coughs> thing and an interesting take to to, uh, to see in the markets as well, because most people would think the price action, the fundamental is usually aligned, but usually the price action kind of front runs the, the fundamentals. So it's almost sometimes like the biggest thesis is coming up with what the future could hold because the market really does like the fundamentals usually do come in line, but it's usually a little bit later than the price action, which is incredibly interesting uh for people who always say you know technicals are terrible i don't think anything is is a, is a terrible thing i think you could trade fundamentally i think you can trade technically i've seen people do it all different all different ways um but just stick to whatever you do and do it well yeah i mean as it, it kind of reminded me as you were talking about bruce kovner and his market wizards interview and he said i need a fundamental reason to hold a position so he doesn't want to just hold something just because of the price, right? But then later, earlier in the chapter, he said, the best trades are the ones where the breakouts come for no reason. And it's sort of like, well, wait a minute. And maybe the difference is, you know, a trade is a short-lived thing, whereas uh, he never specified, and, you know, he doesn't take my calls. So, but, uh, you know, the, uh, the fundamentals is like, he'll hold it long-term if the fundamental idea is there. But it is an interesting point. You know, I've talked to guys who are fundamentalists about marrying sort of what I do or some of what I do with system development with their fundamentals. And the question becomes, okay, let's build a strategy that you align, you do fundamental research and you come up with some kind of basis to hold a position long or short, you know, whatever it may be. And then you use basically trend following models to either have a position or have no position. And it sounds nice. It would probably be good for marketing. It's like, we have a fundamental idea we put on positions only when the technicals align with our fundamentals otherwise we have no position now that said one of the things that i've seen back to the Kovner point is usually the best trades are the ones where the market is doing something that it shouldn't be doing and i guess the best example i could give is the nasdaq in sort of early 2023 so we had inflation we had interest rates we had the silicon valley bank blowing up we had all these reasons that the world was supposedly going to end, right? And 2023 or 22 had been a terrible year. And then all of a sudden in sort of April, May, and I'm just looking at the chart, the NASDAQ gets real quiet and starts making new highs. And it's obviously deviated from this downtrend, you know, drawing trend lines from sort of the end of 21 to the end of uh, 22. And that thing just went up and it didn't look back for a few months and it moved a decent amount. And I've just sort of found that over time. It's like if you trade against the fundamentals when the market's going against them, you can get some explosive moves. And, and I think the reason is, you know, people can't believe it. Right. It's like like when the stock market went up after the global financial crisis or maybe people are too young to remember, but. Everybody's like, this is not over. There's no way it's over. It's total BS. The Fed is, you know, basically putting the markets on life support. And then the stock market just kept going up. And I was one of the guys who was like, this is BS. And then I learned a lot from that stupid mistake. But, you know, the point being, if the retail guy who comes up with a two sentence explanation as to why he's in a trade and really doesn't know much, finds himself shaking his fist at the market in the sky, usually those become good trades that they keep going. And as I'm talking, I'm thinking of something Michael Marcus said, where he said, you know, you need to figure out the psychology of the market and, and how will people feel if this happens? And he would use that in his trading. And it's, it's obviously very, you know, it's not quantifiable, but it's what happens if in the face of these bank failures and interest rates and inflation and lions and tigers and bears, the NASDAQ just keeps going. Well, everybody's going to be trying to sell it or short it and they're going to get caught off guard and boom, you know, the price went from 13,000 to 21,000 over the course of, I don't know, a year, a little over a year. So I, I think those, uh, those things are interesting. And obviously that's a bit confused in aggregate, right? Because it's like, well, wait a minute, should I use the fundamentals? Should I trade against them? Because trades against the fundamentals are good. Should I do some hybrid? Should I just run a system and ignore and the answer to that is it's up to you. You know, I mean, I've toyed with this stuff for so long and there is no right answer. You know, which one do you want to do? It just depends. Are you trying to capture these big move trades that 
go against the fundamentals, if we want to call them that? Or do you want to say, hey, I'm just going to take my position and hold it because I believe long term I'll be right. I know you and I wouldn't do that. Or do you want to just align fundamentals <clears throat> with trend models and only trade when they work the same direction or be in cash? Or do you want to just trade long, short everything? And yeah, it's an interesting kind of like spectrum, I guess you could call it, where you could go from one end to the other and there's no right answer. But maybe the wrong answer is to try to do all of it <laughs> at different times. Probably the right answer is to pick one of those paths. So hopefully that's helpful to just kind of go through how I've thought about all that stuff and say, boy, there's a lot of <clears throat> ways you can peel the onion. None of them are right per se without the benefit of hindsight. But clarifying those things, I think for me, has helped. And it's back to what I was saying about what I'm good at. You know, one of the things I've become very good at over 20 years of doing this is clarifying what I'm trying to capture and not getting a field from that unless I want to change my goals, which I think we keep coming back to goals in these calls every week, right? Goals, goals, goals. So they're very, very important, <coughs> excuse me, important in, uh, in getting where you want to go or, or having your best odds because of the consistency and the persistence. So. Yeah. Um, and that, that's a great point. So let's, if anybody has any questions, uh, Dave, I see you in there. Uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to write in now. Um, but yeah, I think these conversations are incredibly important, especially as we're in the summer doldrums periods. You know, this is the period that uh, when I, when I was working with a lot of different traders, they go on vacations around this time every year you know like i have met so many traders that go on vacations like in august for all of august or september all of september you know i see it i've seen it for years and people don't believe me when i tell them these things but then if you talk to these guys like they'll they'll post it right on twitter you know some of these big guys will talk about their vacations and be like i'm going on vacation this month usually sucks um and it's true, but you just get a lot of chop in the summer. So I think the thing that's hard to do is uh, I'm sure if you looked at how many traders quit and the times they quit, I put money that you would find the summer months being the, the most times people quit because this is a very hard period of trading. And it's either, you know, you do a couple of things. You can not trade. You can follow your system and just continue to put on trades and get chopped up and understand that that's just part of it. Or you can size smaller. You know, there's a there's a bunch of things you can kind of do to really handle this type of volatility. But understanding, it's just like you said, clarifying. The idea for me is always understanding what this looks like. Understanding that the summer is going to be rough for me. Understanding that most of the time my best months and the, the months I make all of my money are always nearly the same. Which is um, late October, November, December, um, through maybe may you know that that's really like anytime i'm having a good run it's usually made around that time so i think that's a an interesting thing to think of yeah i try to get outside for a little bit every day you know i the style of trading that i do i'm not making one percent or anything like it every single day there's ups and downs and Really, instead, everybody does that, George. Everybody makes one percent a day. I know, I know. Usually, like when I have potential clients or clients say, "Like, oh, geez, I found this guy. I want to make this and this, one hundred percent with no drawdowns." I'm like, "When you find them, please tell me, because I want to give them money too. Like, I'll find <laughs> something else." But um, I think I find it's detrimental to sit in front of screens too much for me personally. So I try to get out and do things and it's not always a vacation, but it might just be go outside for an hour, just walk away, you know? And if it starts to get exhausting and overwhelming, you know, usually I design things so that I can sort of adhere to that. Like Ed Sakota said in the original Market Wizards, I only check the end of day prices and that's how I run my systems. And he's not alone. There's a lot of trend followers who are using daily or even weekly prices and they don't pay attention supposedly otherwise i imagine they do but if you design things in a way where you can spend an hour a day or an hour a week i think it gives you that ability to to walk away and, and take breaks because you need them you know you got to take breathers and do other things and i just sent you a link i wrote something um a while back about jobs for traders and one of the things i've found is that very few traders actually spend 
all trading is rarely anyone's sole source of income. Usually they write research or they manage money or they do other things on the side. Um, and they need flexibility because, you know, you can't be in a meeting and be like, sorry, boss, I got to go put this trade on. But um, whether they build around that systematically with a lag or whatever. But there are jobs that people do. A lot of it is real estate. I see a lot of guys getting into real estate. And I think my larger point here is just one of the things that I've found is if you have alternate sources of income, it can help to manage the difficult periods because you're not totally reliant on your next trade and it can start to get into your head. Um, so yeah, for whatever that's worth, I mean, if you can share it over, I'd appreciate it, but it's, it's worth a read because I basically just went through and tallied up everybody I knew or had seen or read about and said, how do they make money through alternate sources? And I, I do think that's one of the keys, you know, find a way to have other sources of income so that if your trading hits the skids for a year or two, or, you know, look, you're a trend follower. I mean, it can be four years of five mm -hmm. of drawdowns. Like that's, that's hard to handle. I don't care how, how much steely resolve you have, unless you made a fortune so that you can live off of it for years or you're earning fees. Good luck going five years without a payday and not losing your sanity. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. So there's some questions it looks like. No, that's a good point. Um, just to just to add to that a little bit, which is, yeah, you know, you every strategy, whatever you do, you're a value investor. There's, you know, there's been 20 years of underperformance. You know, you're a trend follower. There's 10 years. There's, you know, whatever whatever type of trader you are, um, especially, you know, if you're if you're systematic, it will go underwater for extreme periods of time. Um, but you'll survive those extreme periods of time the more systematized you are as a trader. So I think it is, uh, there's a couple different ways to look at it. Um, but the main thing that, that you're bringing up is a good point, which is I, so many of my friends will be like, I want to trade for a living. Uh, you know, I'm going to do it, you know, and they'll be like, I have $50,000. I have a hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to trade for myself and make all the money in the world. Um, and I'm always like, you know, you you don't understand. It's not like that. You could have periods of underperformance. What if you have 100K and you don't make 100% a year um, like like you think you are going to, which you probably won't, but you think you're going to make 100% a year. Um, what if you make 0% in a year? Let's let's just be modest. You know, if it's your first year, you'll probably lose 30%. <laughs> Um, but let's say you just are flat, then you got to take out, let's say you're living by yourself. You got to take out 40 K like, you know, then you're down to 60 K. Like, how do you live on, you know, how are you going to trade? That's not compounding the money anymore. So having some outside uh, source of income, whether it's um, management fees, uh, managing people's money, real estate, having some sort of investment. Whatever it is um, that can bring in income, a job, whatever the job is, and, and I, I shared that on uh, Twitter, um, whatever the job is, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. But I think, like you said, it's it's important for many things, but also your mental health. Your mental health is the most important thing. Not having money coming in, whether you do even have money, um, it still gets rough. So let's get to Dave's question. One more point on that. You know, I think beyond just the the money yeah you know, trading is a very I, I like oliver stone the film director and he talks about how his biography is great like somebody should make a movie out of his life it's it's incredible if, if if you haven't read it i recommend it but um he talks about how writing is a very solitary profession and you're by yourself and it's lonely and i think trading is very similar i mean i know people who talk on discords and things like this but most of the time you're by yourself and what i've sort of found over time is it's probably better to have some responsibility that gets you out of the house dealing with other people and having deadlines. And I know the goal of most traders is I'm going to make so much money that like I could tell the world to, you know, buzz off and, and that's that, but it doesn't seem to be maybe the best thing for people. So something to keep in mind, I think, you know, in the name of balance, because you don't want to be, well, I don't want to say this. I don't want to be 90 years old being like, I spent the last 50 years in front of this screen and I finally got there, but you know, it's just me sitting there. Right. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, the questions you want to, should we go to them? Yeah. Um, how do you preserve, how do you preserve through all the drawdowns? I try to rebalance 
Many go all cash or more cash. So why don't you go, George? Because I explained myself a little bit ago. Um, of course, the sun just hit me here. I have the skylight. It's always around now. Uh, you know, I guess it depends on the specific strategy that I'm using. So if I'm trading discretionarily, let's say long stocks, which is something I like to do, and we go into a bear market, you know, there's nothing, no setups like new highs, then there's nothing to do. So I'll just sit in cash. You know, with systems, generally I will design them in a way to account for that. So if trend is a big part of everything I do, right? And if the trends go down, I may not go entirely to cash, but I'll go predominantly to cash. But I, I think it just depends on how you do it. You know, some guys, some trend followers are always in the market long or short. Other guys could be 100% cash, shades of gray in between, right? So there's no one right answer. You know, my answer is personally, it depends on the style that I'm trading. And I tend to do a couple different styles um, but yeah, usually it's either because there aren't setups to use sort of the William O'Neill idea and a bunch of other guys who kind of studied under him. If you don't have your setup, don't trade. If there's nothing to do, you just wait until there is something to do. That's a big thing they say. And on systems, you can basically design your system to account for that, whether you're always in, always out, or potentially always in or entirely out, you know, um, did I say that right? Yeah. So you're either always long or short, or you could be long, short, or out. Yeah, that's up to you. You can do shades of gray in there too, but there's no one right answer on that either. So hopefully that is a reasonable answer. <clears throat> yeah, perfect. And then um, is it just about confidence and consistency through time and experience? So... I think confidence in yourself is what matters, not confidence in like, I'm going to take this huge position, confidence in, hey, I know I can do this. I think, uh, you know, George said this the other week, which was if um, the people that are the most successful in just about everything are the ones who just don't quit. And that's the truth. If you look over time and throughout history, like the people, yeah, if you just don't quit most things, you're going to get good at it at some point. Um, you can go through trials, tribulations, things can suck, things can be awesome, um, whatever, whatever it is. If you continue to go through those those drawdowns, those bad periods, those uh, hard times that are going to happen inevitably as a trader and you can look inside yourself and go, hey, I, I think I can do this. Hey, and it's going to it's going to work out at some point. And if you keep learning, obviously, if you don't reflect and, and you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you know, I talked to a uh, trader all the time and their their thoughts are always exactly the same like hey you know i need to make all the money in the world and i say hey this is if you want to really be leveraged and take a leverage bet this is probably not the time uh, the market is not in a state where it's just trending and everything's moving and there's trades all around you could spin around throw a dart at it at that point you want to take a concentrated bet i don't care um, go for it but if the market's just choppy and there's no real trends moving um, and there's a few trades that are working out well, uh, you know, bonds, gold, some things, and those basically create those. Uh, so the drawdowns aren't that big. That's exactly how I think of it. Sometimes you have a few trades that are working really well. Now you have a situation where you're, you're flat on your performance, mainly because these few trades are working well. So, you know, figure out your strategy and then be confident about that strategy, but also be paranoid about drawdowns and losing money. And like between all of those things, you can uh, do this, but it just takes time. Uh, my answer would be confidence. Yes. I mean, if you're not confident in your strategy, <clears throat> then why would you be doing it? Right. I mean, it's just, yeah. If you were like, I don't know if this is going to work over time. Like, I don't think anybody would logically do whatever it is they're doing if they don't believe it'll work. Consistency, I think it's very important. We've talked about it before, but I guess the thing that really was an eye opener to me was maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I started looking at the hedge fund rankings for every given year. And it would be uh, this year it's commodity stocks and next year it's Chinese equities and then it's short subprime and then it's long, large cap US stocks. And I think there were periods, I know there were periods where, you know, George Soros was the greatest manager or um, Julian Robertson, 
but that was a different era when there were not there wasn't as much competition and they had edge that wasn't competed away. So when you see the top ranking guys year by year now, it's it's almost never the same person who decided like, hey, this year I'm going to go long commodities because that's where it's going to be at. Right. And next year I'm going to go short Chinese stocks because I know. So if you really look at that and think about it, what does it show you? It shows you that the best performers any given year are probably just there plying their trade, whatever it may be, until the the tailwind catches them for their sector. There are those um, box graphics that show the best asset classes ranked, you know, each given year, and they'll take 10 or 20 of them and show like, here's the year and here's the best norse. And nothing is ever at the top. So I think that consistency is important because if we go back to that returns are clustered, if you, if you try to be like, over here and then you're over there and then you're over there when the the proverbial tailwind comes back to here you might be over there so you uh you you can't um you kind of need to stay consistent sorry i was thinking about scary movie three with uh kevin hart and uh uh what's his simon rex he's like oh yeah over there anyway um but yeah I, i think the key is you do have to be consistent now you can diversify across within that but generally if you diversify you won't make as much money. You won't have as big a drawdowns either. If you concentrate on one strategy, you'll do really well when that strategy does well and you'll do worse when it doesn't. So you can't sort of cheat the the returns, the volatility that you're going to experience, the drawdowns based on where you want to live um, on that spectrum. And I guess the one other thing I'd say on that is just people talk about, well, when should I change a system? And it's an unanswerable question really you know nobody really knows what the future is so <clears throat> oh well th- will this system work going forward i mean the original turtle system stopped working for a long period of time and that happens to almost all systems and so then you have to come in and say well what should i do should i stick with it and hope that it comes back 30 years later or should i do a different system and really the best thing that i've found it's going to be repetitive but it's like find those baseline principles you know for me they're Ride your winners, cut your losses, respect price action. So I believe in that because I can get out of the way of trouble and I'll live to fight another day. Um, From there, I think that you need to just clarify what are you trying to capture? And if your system is simple enough or your process is simple enough, it will capture what it's designed to capture. And then you just have to decide, am I confident that that's the place to be? And for me, all often, I mean, I like to align with fundamental realities. So one might be, about $500 billion a year goes into the U.S. retirement system based on modern portfolio theory. That money goes in because there's tons of advisors and endowments and things to just put money in it, right? Every time they get it. So that's a big tailwind. You know, U.S. equities, Buffett says, well, you're buying a stake in a business. I kind of like to align with long side of stocks too, because societally we can't do everything ourselves, right? So we have to have people that specialize and then businesses make money. Um, They're going to charge an amount that enables them to make a profit or they're going to go out of business. So you're really taking a stake in a company that's a a profit earning entity and you participate in the upside. So I'll like to trade stocks on the long side, especially where I know people are going to spend money. But I do cut losses because those principles are a larger thing. So I have confidence that if I can survive long enough and I use these principles that enabled 100 years of great traders to survive, they make sense logically. And I align with businesses that are going to grow, I'll do well over time. Now, I know that to the point of this whole call or this week, there's going to be periods where it sucks. And right now is one of them. But um, yeah, that's just kind of the way it goes. So hopefully that's a very long winded answer that helps to to clarify once again, like no right answer. You know, so yeah. All right, guys, we're going to end it there. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're here every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Um, please check us out on YouTube as well. I'll be put it, posting a edited version of this, um, basically seeing about the algorithm. If we can figure out the algorithm on YouTube, that'll be uh, the million dollar question. So, all right, guys, you guys have a good one. Thank you.